Hello again, this is Nick Schramick and Howard Chow with Dune Insights and uh, our podcast, What's Next In? On this episode, we are uh, again looking at ag and food tech and this time with a company called FarmNG. So FarmNG is a robotics company that has built a, uh, a novel platform for um, uh, essentially an electronic vehicle on the farm. Um, so they uh, came to our and presented at our, our um, spring food and ag tech workshop and also brought one of their vehicles with us. Uh, Howard, um, you've been looking at robotics on the farm for a decade now. Um, There's still an interesting category and we still find interesting startups here. Well, this year we actually had several robotics uh, plays. And so it seems to be, I mean, you know, waves, different waves come through every year and what's fashionable or what's uh, hot and current. But um, Farm and G was a, a, a very interesting um, technology and play and platform and product. Um, they're a, a, a low cost do it yourself type of, of farm robot that can be used for multiple purposes, uh, reconfigured, modularized for different uh, for different use cases. Um, and uh, my impression is very scrappy, very innovative. Uh, and I think they got a lot of interest from the audience. So I think it's just, this should be an interesting uh, uh, video for, for our audience. Great. Well, here is uh, Ethan Rubley, the founder of FarmNG, presenting at our spring workshop. We're I, I'm the CEO, founder of, of FarmNG. My name is Ethan Rubley, based here in Watsonville, California. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you what we build. So our first product, uh, this is La Makina Amiga. Uh, we've been building this since 2021. It's a small-scale electric robotic tractor. So this is, uh, it's open source, uh, it's repairable, it's extensible by the grower, um, and you can buy it online with a credit card. So if you'll go to the next slide. So here's uh, just to get a sense of uh, use cases uh, of the Amiga. So we we build this in Watsonville, we take sheets of steel and turn them into robots. Uh, we develop all the software, all of the electronics for this. Um, this is essentially an electric wheelbarrow that's software defined. Um, and we found that this provides, even when manually operating it uh, with a joystick, um, uh, this, this provides an ROI to our customers. Um, it pays for itself within a year of operation in most cases. And uh, it, we have simple attachments, three-point hitches, just carrying matter around the farm. This is about a thousand pound payload. Um, and we have, I'll get into the customer segments segment soon, um, but this is meant to be a software-defined electric vehicle robotic platform. It's about a one, one to two horsepower platform. Um, and next slide. So uh, we our our vision at Farm and G is really to transform uh, our agricultural systems in terms of robotics and AI and and those technologies because we really see that our food system needs to transform dramatically over the next thirty years in order for us to deal with climate change and population growth and loss of biodiversity and and this vision has basically led to a superstar team, like the best team I've ever had the fortune to work with uh, that is so passionate about applying robotics and their expertise to this space, the food system. Um, and so we have uh, Claire Delanoy just joined us as our COO um, full-time as of a couple months ago. Uh, she was formerly the VP uh, of of robotics at NVIDIA. And then we have some really great SLAM expertise in our CTO and uh, Chief Science Officer position with Hauke Strasta and Stephen Lovegrove. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, so of course, our thesis is that this is really all about software. So we, we, sell, we sell software to farmers and we wrap it in sheet metal so that they actually pay for it. Um, so our, uh, So we have now, uh, you know, a, a, a NVIDIA Xavier, uh, soon to be an Orin kind of computer with a touch screen and smart cameras and RTK GPS. So we're, we're, and we're making this very affordable. So our, if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, um, so, you know, for the cost of $13,000 for a robotic base, that's very flexible, multi-purpose and, and, you know, $7,000 for a computer and you know, RTK and advanced sensors, uh, we're enabling our customers to start experimenting with crop systems that involve 
you know, the use of, you know, uh, AI on the edge on this platform. Uh, we have customers that are using this for uh, creating open source data sets to lower the barrier for, you know, aut automation. Our platform, you know, comes with a license to the software with all of this capability built into it. So, you know, you can do precision RTK guidance and path following and start experimenting with applying uh, these capabilities in either a commercial setting or in a research uh, uh, research setting or and we have customers uh, across education farms and uh, and startups and and so and and here uh, you know we're also starting to do machine learning on the edge so this platform is capable of kind of lowering the cost and the barrier of entry of applying all of these techniques in, in real field settings. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, we've, we, we are now on our sixth version of the Amiga. Uh, we've been producing it since August. This is our first model that we meant to build 100 of them. Uh, since August last year, we've built and sold 60. Um, they're all over the United States um, at top tier uh, ag tech companies. Uh, I think I used the wrong logo for Verdant, so I'm sorry, Gabe. Um, so Gabe, I think we just delivered our third Amiga to Gabe's team yesterday. Um, and uh, you know, CMU and the USDA has just purchased two, and they're starting to deploy these in, or maybe three. I'm not sure. I lose count now. Um, and then we have some great local farm partners, including Jacobs Farm, Del Cabo, uh, Bonnie Dune. We have a farm in Bonnie Dune, Sea to Sky was one of our first customers. Um, Alba and Driscoll Reichschwan. So we're we're really seeing that there's these these early adopters that where this platform uh, makes a lot of sense for them to. Uh, so just last slide. Um, just want to show some of our kind of customers, then I'll I'll take questions. Um, so uh, in the in, in February we started delivering. Um, we signed delivered 15 of, of these Amigas to universities all over the country. Um, and so we currently have about 180 students working on top of this platform, innovating on robotic platforms in uh, their local food sheds all over the US uh, and applying these to kind of areas of research that we had never dreamt of and wouldn't have actually the ability to innovate in, including you know, grain systems in the Midwest, uh, peanut harvesting, cotton, um, as, as well as vegetable and wine systems. So uh, we're, we're excited to see this, uh, this platform really, really starting to take off. Yeah. Ethan, that's a very impressive um, presentation. Um, I, I actually have two questions. One is uh, just following on the comments that were made earlier. So how the hell did you launch your first product with $250,000? Because that just seems implausible to me. So maybe you can explain to us what the economics of that was or whether you just subsidized that heavily with your sweat. Um, and then the second uh, question is, is you, you seem to have a, a somewhat different business model than more traditional, you know, tractor companies, right? <laughs> so you're not just selling hardware, you're selling software, but you also have an op open source platform. So presumably you're allowing other people to build on top of your platform. And, uh, you know, so what, what is the monetization strategy for that? In other words, are you, are you creating a, a platform where you're going to take a uh, rent on people basically selling software on your system, or are you selling, are you making profit from the hardware or your, your licensing fees? I mean, what, what is the, the monetization strategy? Well, yeah, so we're. You know, we're still a startup, so that changes frequently, right? <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I think what's been working for us and what are, uh, uh, so I'll start with the monetization side. So um, I've never been able to get a customer to buy a robot in the 12 years that I've been working on robotics products. It was always, you know, there was a pilot, a paid pilot, um, you know, a promise of ARR, you know, uh, let's do robots as a service. And, and uh, I was kind of sick of that. And so we, we wanted to find a product that we could build and sell. And we knew that, okay, if you were willing to pay $10,000 for this robot, that you would use it and that you would value it. 
and we wanted to make sure that we had profit, like unit, you know, good unit economics on that. So our target was let's let's sell it for ten thousand dollars, build it for five thousand. Um, and uh, so we spent, um, you know, uh, a year um, built four prototypes in garages, and uh, and that's where we spent our two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And we 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 uh, while we were building these these iterations of the robot, we were licensing open source calibration and slam tools to other robotics startups in Silicon Valley to pay for the development of this. Um, and, and so that's, we, we bootstrap for the first two years. Um, and, and then we, uh, we, we kind of figured out that, okay, a farmer would buy, would buy an asset. Uh, we, our first customer was Jacob Del Cabo. We did a $70,000 paid pilot. At the end of that, they kept three machines. Uh, and then gave us a loan to buy parts for to build a hundred of these of these vehicles. And so um, that's when we set up a factory, a ten thousand square foot factory last year in Watsonville, um, and and really really kind of leaned into building affordable, you know, l- lightweight electric vehicles. And and then our, our I think our midterm uh, monetization strategy is primarily high growth um, hardware hardware sales and um you know the hardware comes with the license uh some of it is closed source we have an open api uh we the more people that build on top of it the more uh you know we become uh the platform that people want to build on top of and uh and we make sure that we have the features that our customers need the software features right now that our customers need are over the air update you know uh talking to smart cameras GPS, like logging, you know, very simple features. Um, and, and that's what we're pro- focused on productizing and that's what's built into the, into the platform. And so, and I, and I also, I see, you know, basically as, as long as we have high growth in, in the hardware sales and good margins that are basically justified by the, the software that's embedded in the hardware, that's probably what we'll continue to do until we saturate that. You're going to ask answer the question about how you did two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Oh, I think I, I answered. Your okay, right, right. yeah. Okay. Um, just to build on that, because I have some inside information. Yeah. You're using off-the-shelf e-bike batteries, right? So, you, I mean, you made that oh. platform work, but you tried not to customize any as much as possible, right? Yeah, our first our first ten amigos were um, no custom electronics, uh, just some Python code and kind of Arduino style. Uh, you're not vertically integrated, is what you're saying. Well, now we now we are. You're so right. we we do pick and place in our factory. Um, we do all of our EE. Uh, we do all our assembly. We laser cut steel. Um, you can anyone's welcome to come down to Watsonville and get a factory tour to see how we make these things. So, um, uh, because yeah, and and the sales of these units pays for the you know pays for that infrastructure. So you'll see we have 25 people. A lot of those people are actually making these robots and you know supporting our customers in their use. Well, just picking up on a couple of things Gabe said. Gabe talked about space, right? Uh, and uh, and navigation last. And so can you talk about GPS denied navigation and space and how that relates to PharmaG? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I, I think I, in, in spirit aligned with Gabe that autonomy kind of comes last for a product company in this space. Like you need to find a value proposition for the, for your customers that is not predicated on advanced you know, GPS denied navigation and control. Uh, but we know we need it eventually. And so one of our bootstrapping techniques has been to license essentially our autonomy stack to aerospace. So um, our vision navigation and GPS denied navigation stack and our state estimation stack is currently in use on a moon lander uh, with a startup uh, Firefly Aerospace uh, based in uh, in Austin, Texas. And they're due to land on the moon with our navigation technology in uh, mid 2024. And so that, that's also given us uh, substantial revenue. And that basically pays for that deep tech team 
uh, to mature mature our autonomy stack that once we can show the value proposition to growers, then we, we can port it to earth. You should put that in your advertising, you know, <laughs> that's a pretty good pitch. <laughs> um, yeah. Farmers can go to the moon too. So. Yeah. <laughs> Lars has a good question. Yeah, Ethan, I, I love this platform. I think it's really compelling, and I'm going to buy a bunch of them, actually. Um, and that's how compelling I think it is. And I, I was wondering why you think that might be. And like, my thought was, you described it as a as a wheelbarrow. And I think that might be such a differentiated way of viewing the platform versus people who are trying to make automated tractors. That that's actually what makes it so like just uniquely. It strikes me as very different from a design concept right from the beginning. Is that something you agree with or you add to? Yeah, and I, and I think this also goes to something that Gabe was saying earlier, which is like, um, as roboticists, as technologists, it's too easy to want to to like use your hammer of AI and advance for you know make humanoids that can have you know thirty two DOF or whatever and do dexterous manipulation. And but it turns out, well, we were working with growers in greenhouses where they couldn't get a tractor in place, and so like they were pushing a cedar with two people, right? And so if you gave them an electrically self-driven, you know, seater, then you could replace those two people with one person and then free up that other person to go do some other task on the, on the, on the farm. So, um, you know, especially in our region in specialty production, we're finding, you know, our farms are, they're labor limited. Like they, they're, they could be, they could be grossing so much more if they could take that small team of 10 people that manages 20 acres and like, actually fully cultivate and grow on those 20 acres and so i think it, we 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 um it seems like it's but it's a very it's j just getting to market even with an electric wheelbarrow that has a good customer experience is, takes a long time and um and to get it right and to make it easy and get to get buy-in from the crew to get buy-in from the maintenance team to get buy-in from the owner uh of the farm and so um yeah we've I'm not sure if I answered your question, but yeah. One last quick comment. Yeah. Ethan, I actually, this isn't a question. It's a, it's a confession. You had me a compost spreader. So when I actually saw this machine and I saw what you were capable of doing, because you came up these roads here and you can imagine a farm across the street, you can't get a central Valley truck up here to go and just spread compost on. So particularly as you're looking at the smaller and mid-sized farm, it's by hand. It is wheelbarrow. And this is a wheelbarrow replacement for a lot of those farms, particularly like in the Watsonville area. Those kind of farms, it's harder to get those big, you know, semis out there just to drop uh, compost. And so at any rate, that was when I realized, like, there's something, you're, you're addressing a unique pain point that a lot of folks wouldn't understand. Compost spreading is not that sexy. Great. Well, I'm afraid we're, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Ethan. Great. Thank you.